Oscar Grant, Oakland, California. Michael Brown, Ferguson, Missouri. Freddie Gray, Baltimore, Maryland. Sandra Bland, Hempstead, Texas. Tamir Rice, Cleveland, Ohio. John Watson, Dayton, Ohio. Laquan McDonald, Chicago, Illinois. Rakia Boyd, Chicago, Illinois. Eric Garner, New York City, New York. India Cummings, Buffalo, New York. Alicia McCullers, Rochester, New York. Hayden Blackman, Rochester, New York. Lawrence Rogers, Rochester, New York. Izzy Andino, Rochester, New York. Greg Davis, Rochester, New York. All of these people, as you know, some of them you've heard of, some of you may not have heard of, were killed by police officers committing no crime. They were killed, people of color. And we believe this has to stop. There are many people, such as Benny War, who Susan mentioned, and hundreds, probably thousands of other people of color, mostly black, who have been, come probably within a hair's breadth of being killed by the police. And our report that we've written over the course of the last two years records the beating, the racial profiling of ordinary people who happen to be black, such as Benny War, who was killed, who was killed, who was beaten up, almost killed, uh, waiting for a bus while black by the Rochester Police Department. Um, there are many others that we've uh, noted. Uh, most recently, you may have heard of Lentoria Parker, who was beaten, uh, attacked by a police officer while her husband was being, uh, her boyfriend was being uh, arrested for drug charges. She was just asking what was going on, why are you doing that? The policeman told her to go back into her yard. She turned to go back into her yard and the policeman attacked her. Quentin Keene was on the phone with his grandmother in a laundromat and the police were looking for someone who didn't look like him, who had a gun near the laundromat and he was beaten. Brandon Carter was dancing in the transit center. He was arrested, tased. Um, David Van was at a store trying to get the correct change from a store, refused to leave the store. Police were called, he was beaten. The list goes on and on and on. So what we've come to realize is that the police do not police themselves. The police in Rochester, like many other cities across the country and towns across the country, when an officer commits brutality, they don't do anything. They may reprimand the officer, a memo may go in the officer's file, um, but very rarely is any discipline, any severe discipline. You would think that for killing, a, killing someone, you'd, you'd be fired, or for beating someone up, you'd be fired. It doesn't happen. Um, we have in Rochester an internal affairs department that's called the Professional S uh, Standards Section. And they are supposed to investigate police uh, misconduct. They investigate, but very rarely does anything come of it. Rochester has what's called a Civilian Review Board, which is a board of civilians um, and this board is run by the Center for Dispute Settlement, a nonprofit organization. This board of civilians 
when a complaint is made, so say when Benny War makes a complaint against the police officers who beat him up, it goes to the professional standards section of the police department. They investigate the complaint and then they send the complaint to the civilian review board. The civilian review board does not do any investigation on its own. So they take an investigation that's already complete and they look at it. The professional standards section has already made a determination on what the outcome is going to be for the officer and for the person who complained, otherwise known as the complainant. And the civilian review board most of the time will look at that investigation and make a very similar finding. Then both of those findings go to the chief of police who ultimately makes the decision about what happens in terms of the discipline of the officer. In Rochester, the professional standards section sustains complaints, means that they find the police officer to be um, guilty of the misconduct. The professional standards section sustains those complaints 3% of the time. The civilian review board sustains the complaints 5% of the time. And when it goes to the chief of police, which it always does, the chief of police of Rochester for the past 24 years has only sustained complaints 2% of the time. Chicago, Illinois has a similar sustain rate. And we all know the, the reputation the police in Chicago have. So Rochester is right up there with Chicago in terms of how we um, hold our police accountable. So what we're trying to do is to bring uh, awareness to this fact, to change this system so that we have a new police accountability board that will do its own investigations, will be a separate department of the police, of the city council, of the city, um, will be a, will be able to issue subpoenas to uh, compel witnesses to testify, including officers, to compel evidence, and we'll be able to enact discipline rather than the police department or this chief of police enacting the discipline. We've studied over the past two years, we've studied 15 years worth of data um, from the annual reports of the professional standards section and the annual reports of the civilian review board and that's where we've gotten these percentages that I've mentioned to you. And we've also studied um, about 15, 10 or 15 other civilian review processes in other cities around the country. And we found that um, some of them do very well and most of them don't do great, but a lot of them do better than Rochester. And in fact, um, Syracuse, just 90 miles up the road, Syracuse, New York, has sustained an average, has a sustain rate of an average of about 23% um, over the past three years. So that's huge compared to 2%, we're talking about 23%. <coughs> so we've looked at this, the process in Syracuse and in some other cities, actually, actually Oakland, California has um, recently enacted a more robust civilian review process that includes all the things that we mentioned, including discipline. Um, and so that's what we're hoping to accomplish in Rochester over the next year is to make this an election issue for city council, for um, the mayor, the mayor election and to generate some support around Rochester around this issue to get police to be really accountable. And um, one of the reasons they don't want to be accountable is because of the union. The unions, police unions hold a lot of power and they don't want to be accountable to anyone. So that's going to be, you know, a big, a big fight. So what we're looking for is um, to 
garner some support, to um, raise consciousness, and um, I'm going to stop right there and see what Ted wants to add to the story and then, you know, entertain some questions. I'm sure there's a lot I'm leaving out. Um, I just want to start by saying that uh, the demands that we're making with the Police Accountability Board are not new. In fact, they've been community driven for over 50 years. It started with Reverend Franklin Florence in the 60s. And then it moved down to Reverend Graves, Raymond, Raven, Raymond L. Graves, who was a staunch opponent of police misconduct and brutality. In the uh, 70s, 80s, 90s, and then you had, um, to up to today, you have United Christian Leadership Ministry, led by Re Reverend Lewis Stewart, who's also pushing this envelope as well. So these demands are not new. They're not radical. Um, they are not off the charts, there are demands that have been made by this community in Rochester, by the black community in Rochester, for over 50 years, and they are demands um, that are consistent with uh, Department of Justice consent decrees on police departments across the country. So none of this is like wild, new, fangled, speculative, um, unknown, uncharted territory. Um, it's, it's all pretty, uh, pretty standard by some accounts, which is uh, good and, uh, a, a, you know, a validation in, in some way. So um, the, uh, the Police Accountability Board, um, as Barbara said, has uh, the power to compel the chief to discipline, has subpoena power, and is an independent investigatory arm of, um, for, in, in a, a, has its own independent investigation investigatory power and um, the discipline is kind of a new thing um, but basically we have there would be like a, a, a sort of a, a I want to say they call it a disciplinary matrix we found this report from a guy named John Shane who is a criminologist former uh, police commander in New Jersey and he thought that the way that police chiefs dispensed discipline was completely discretionary and um, harmful to the morale of the police department. And he suggested uh, something called the disciplinary matrix. And so that essentially is um, uh, a straightforward progressive form of discipline where everyone knows what's going on, the officers, the union, the city, the department, and it's agreed to by all those entities <clears throat> and as if, if an officer is able, uh, has complaints against them, uh, prior complaints, prior sustained complaints, those would be included in the calculation for the level of discipline. And so the more sustained complaints, the closer and closer they get to dismissal. If you, um, uh, if you brutalize someone, if you use excessive use of force, that's very close to the top bracket of uh, penalty. And there, the first uh, penalty is a 30-day suspension. The second is a 35-day suspension and, and, and a demotion. And the third offense is, is outright you know, dismissal, fired, fired from the force. Um, and Shane, this police commander, argued that this was actually a far more fair and just system um, to, to be used as discipline within police departments. We took that model and kind of added another component that said that the civilians who are hearing these complaints would then have the power to compel the chief to actually enforce this discipline, even if the chief did not agree. So in a sense, it's taking the power out of the chief's hands and putting it in the hands of the board, um, whose, I guess, overall mission is to decrease the amount of police misconduct against civilians of the city of Rochester. That's the purpose of the board. It's to curb bad behavior, systemic behavior. This doesn't fall under just one mayor, one police chief, one city council. It, it, we looked at 15 years of data, and that's multiple police chiefs, multiple city councils, multiple mayors. And it, so this isn't just a question of a few bad apples or 
if we just get a new police chief, this is a question of systematically abolishing what we have now and replacing it with something that actually has the power to, to make a real difference, to get some modicum of justice for people that have been brutalized by the police. I think that that's a lot of Yeah, why don't we stop there and answer questions? If there are questions. Yes. Um, I know that, or I, I believe that the city council has subpoena power now. Um, why have they, have they ever mentioned why they never used it? And with <coughs> the police accountability on that, did you ever find that people like, that when police, like in Rochester, we have an occupying force. They, most of them do not live in the city. And do you find that when police live in the community or within the, the city that there's any difference? Or is that, you know, have you found any evidence or is there any evidence with that? Or is it just systemic that it doesn't matter where they live, it's just, the whole system is broken. That's a two-part question, and I'm not very good at answering two-part questions because I can't remember what was the first question. I, I can answer the first one. If okay. You want to take the second. Oh, okay. If that's okay. Um, so yeah, the city council currently has subpoena power, so that means that the city council can uh, furnish a subpoena and demand uh, witnesses testify, demand evidence production, that type of thing. Um, and their argument has always been, well, nobody's ever come to us and asked for it. That's crazy. What? We would, of course, do it, but nobody's ever come. You know, it, it, it's, uh, it's, it's not in the legislation from 1992. The way the legislation in 1992, the Civilian Review Board works, is that if there's an instant where the Civilian Review Board disagrees with the Investigation of Professional Standards section. It can request via letter to Professional Standards section to conduct a further investigation into the complaint. If after that further investigation they do not like the investigative findings, they can write a letter to the Chief of Police and ask for the same thing. And if they don't like what the Chief has found, they can write to the Mayor. And if they don't like what the Mayor has found, they can write to City Council, at which point and this is in the legislation, this is in the process as it works now, city council can, they will vote on whether or not to accept the case, and then at that point it becomes a public hearing, and subpoena power comes into play, as per this 92 legislation, and then um, they would conduct their own investigation, send that, those findings back to that panel who heard that complaint, and then they would make a decision based on that. So 24, years of this mechanism being in practice, that's never happened. The farthest they've gotten is maybe to the level of PSS where they've asked for them to, you know, could you go and investigate this a little more? Well, and there was one time we heard about that, that the police chief, that it went to the mayor, somehow got to the mayor, and the mayor called the police chief, and they had a conversation about it, and the mayor decided, oh yeah, okay, you're right. Oh. And called the complainant back. And, and that said, was it. Yep. So there's another piece that I want to talk about, but I want to answer your second part of your question, which is, I don't know to the first part, which is I don't know what, we haven't done any research on what happens when there's police who live within the city limits. Do they, are they better at policing because they live within the city limits and they have to go home? One would still not assume that they would go home to the neighborhoods in which they're targeting. I mean, because what happens here is mostly black, poor, and Latino, poor, black, and Latino people are being targeted. Now, the amount of money that a police officer makes, you might not assume that they would be living in the same neighborhood. Um, so I can't really answer that part of the question, but I can say that it does it's, it's systemic, which means that um, like Ted said, it's not just a few bad apples. It's not just, oh, well, there's a few police officers who do this, but everybody else is good. Well, or you could say, well, it's the white officers, but it's probably not the black officers. 
But we've seen indication, you know, video mm -hmm. of a white officer beating up a black person and a black officer standing there watching. So the, the, the issue is that there's this thin blue line, there's this old boy network, there's this uh, guard your, you know, if you say anything against your fellow officer, you're going to be, you know, in danger. You know, other cops are going to do shit to you because, you know, I mean, I don't have to explain that anymore. It's like you're in the club, you have to enforce the rules of the club. The police force is only as good as its bad officers. So there can, can only be a few bad apples, but all of those other apples are reinforcing they're not going to turn on those bad apples because that would go against the code. It's like in um, A Few Good Men, you know, you know where, where they, they wouldn't call each other out, you know. Um, but you can't handle the truth. <laughs> um, so the other thing I wanted to say is that part of the issue here with the Civilian Review Board is that it's a it's it's a nonprofit organization, so it doesn't have any incentive to go against the police because essentially it's under contract to the city through the police. So, so if you're under contract, and actually their budget line comes from the city council through the police department, so they're not paid directly by the police but their contract depends on them um, getting along with the police. And you know, if they don't do, if they started calling out the police, the police could easily say, well, we're not gonna give this contract to you, we're gonna give it to somebody else. So it's a conflict of interest, basically, for a, for a nonprofit organization to be contracted under the police department to hold the police department accountable. That doesn't make any sense. So what we're calling for is an independent department of the city of Rochester with a board and a hired administrator. And the board is not dependent upon getting, you know, the city to be, to exist. They exist because they've been appointed or elected. And that's the other thing is we want to have some of them elected, some of them appointed and um, some, yeah, appointed by various council members, appointed by the mayor, elected through, you know, general elections, general elections and representing people, like everyday people, as opposed to most of the people who serve on the Civilian Review Board right now have to pay $200 to get trained. They have to be able to travel to Canandaigua to get trained. They have to be able to take a week off of work or not work to get trained, and so it favors a kind of a, a subset of privileged people as opposed to regular everyday people on the street to be able to, to do this. And it's supposed to represent the city of Rochester ethnically and racially. Well, when it started out 25 years ago, it did, but today it doesn't. Um, it's 75% white male at this point. So, yes. I'm sorry, and then you. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I just wanted to speak to the fact that it, this is kind of like a taboo subject to bring up in leftist circles, but one of the powers behind that, um, behind um, police power is the police union. And the police union, as a matter of fact, is the force that has fought against residency requirements in the past. Um, there are three uh, occupations that are specifically um, exempt from any sort of residency requirements. Um, but it just, it's teachers, firefighters, and police officers. And so my right. um, so my question is, I guess, how is this um, this plan going to um, work with or around police union measures? Yeah, that's a good question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Barbara likes to toss me all the easy ones. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think first thing that we would say is that at this point, we're open to working with anyone. So 
That means that if Mike Mazio wants to sit down with us, we'll meet. And Mike we, Mazio is the head of the Locust Club, which is the police, police union. <coughs> Thank you. Um, and we've actually reached out to him. Um, I don't think we've heard back from him. No. So that invitation is extended. You know, um, depending on where that goes, that might change. And we are very well aware that there are police union issues of resistance. Um, and I kind of feel like I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop in some way. Um, but I think the important thing is that if we can get a groundswell going of people talking about this, you know, chatting it up on social media, having discussions in your coffee houses or wherever you go to mingle with people, um, and, and start hosting more forums, train more people on the report so they can go and talk to more people, that the city is going to have a situation where there's people wanting change and demanding change, and they're going to have to react to that. Um, the other issue is that this year, right now, currently, the police union contract is in negotiation. And so if the city played ball and went to bat for the people of, God, all these baseball analogies, went to bat for you know, the, uh, the, 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 the civilians of Rochester, they could um, demand that discipline be removed from the police chief and instead insert the police accountability board which would then mean that the board would have to be at that table potentially. It would have to have a voice in those conversations. Um, and it would, it would create a situation where the chief uh, would no longer be able to have uh, a 2% sustain rating over 15 years, you know, which is dismal. Does that kind of yeah, yeah, <laughs> answer some of that? Yeah, I mean, so I feel like right now we, we've, um, we've definitely talked about the union. Um, overtures have been made. We haven't heard back. And we're kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop to find out what. I'm sure that we will be having many, many conversations with the union yeah. going forward. And, and, and Reverend Stewart actually has a, a relationship with Mike Mazio. We knew that. But we're, we're working with the Coalition for Police Reform on this effort. So it's enough is enough. And the Coalition for Police Reform, which is a a coalition of people who want police reform, imagine that. And, you know, some of us have different relationships than others, like some of the coalition are more familiar with the city council and the mayor and the union, and we're more familiar with the people who've actually been brutalized. And so working together by having all these different community connections, we're hoping that we'll be able to really make a difference community-wide. Your, your question? Um, as far as the composition of the civilian review board, I was wondering if you had put any thought into doing it like jury duty, where there would be a certain number of seats that were selected ran um, randomly. Um, I like the idea of them being elected or appointed, but that also sort of assumes some affinity with the political class, for the people who would populate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we've been warned about that. That's 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 definitely an issue. Um, I have kind of a biased view of jury duty having been in the past year to three different trials where the jurors were mostly um, middle class white people from the suburbs who had no concept whatsoever what it means to be black in the city of Rochester. So if people could be educated or if we could make it um, a jury, a true jury of one's peers where you, you're jury members are from your at least same city if not neighborhood um, that would make that would make sense to me but um, some of the juries that I've seen just boggle the mind like there were two people on one jury who had not been into the city of Rochester for 10 years literally so how do they have any understanding you know just but, to be clear, I'm not suggesting like the actual same process. Oh but no, I mean, yeah, and that's a, that's a good idea, and we can write it down. <coughs> although we don't have anything to write with, could somebody write that down? AJ. Yeah. Uh, so I, I wanted to mention. I'll write it down. Go ahead. I wanted to mention uh, something that might be relevant to that. Uh, so one, there was uh, some newspaper coverage of the report and of the proposal. Um, in the in the uh, Democrat Chronicle. Really? 
<laughs> That's pretty right. cool. All right, right, yeah. And so um, well, one thing that might be relevant to so the question you're asking about the union is, at the very least, it's, it's almost, almost shockingly, the, uh, Mike Mazio said that he was actually in favor of uh, giving subpoena power to yeah. an independent, independent uh, investigatory agency. So that is, if, if anything, the best sign for the possibility of something being done on this ground. Because I would imagine that the union, as, as you indicated, would be the biggest obstacle to trying to get something like this. Right. Um, so that's you know, one somewhat hopeful sign. Okay. Yeah, I had, uh, I had forgotten what Mazio said. That is very helpful. Yeah. Another uh, aspect or thing I wanted to ask you guys is, so uh, do you have a sense of how many investigations or complaints actually come in to, or are investigated every year? Because that might play into what you were saying about city council subpoena power. Like, if how many reports are coming in? Is this something that city council, if that's an excuse somebody uses that, oh, well, city council, the mayor can just investigate themselves. If it's so many complaints coming in that there's, it takes so long to investigate, you need a full-time sort of person or investigatory body to do this. It can't be something that city council takes up in the spare time. I mean, most years before, uh, I'm looking at my report here, before, um, most years before 2004, it didn't even break 100, but it was over 50. And then after 2005, it's like 50 or below. I mean, it's not an inordinate amount of cases. And, and the reason we think there's not a lot of cases, not a lot of complaints, is because people are discouraged by the process. If, you, if you've gone, you know, beating your head against the wall, and it never comes out in your favor, then it gets to a kind of why bother kind of thing. If you know that the process isn't going to be fair, then why bother? So we're, we're kind of holding on to that the number of complaints has dropped, and the reason the number of complaints has dropped is because there's a loss of faith in the process. Well, so. and I was just going to add to that. There's also the fact that the city doesn't make it very easy to access what that process even is. I mean, right. you look on their website and you scroll around looking for like police accountability stuff and and one of the, I think it was like about about the professional standards section, there's a line at the bottom that says, make a comment about an employee. And it's like, what? And it's just like one little blue line at the bottom of their page and you click on that and it takes you to a form to fill out regarding like police, uh, uh, you know, misconduct report. But it's, it's it, you even search for it, or it's not even the side. It's not in the sidebar. Um, you have to know what you're searching for. I don't know you. Right, and and and, and also, um, oftentimes people call the civilian review board and they don't get any answer. Right. They never get called back. Okay. Um, I I had an in, just heard about an incident where a woman, <coughs> um, her son David Van, was beaten by the police and put in jail. And she called the professional standards section to make a complaint, and they said, oh, well, he has to make the complaint himself. Well, he was in jail. So technically, I just talked to Charlie Burkwood about this, technically they should have gone to him and interviewed, interviewed him in jail. Instead, and she has kept this recording of this conversation, instead, they said, oh, well, he has to, you know, come himself, and too bad, you know. So they don't make it easy. Yes. Um, I was also thinking and then you that probably um, there's also the fear of retaliation. Because, oh, and that happens. Um, I know we've been here at the Squirrel have been, um, you know, have received retaliation for things that uh, Rochester New Media has published or people who are here and we have a meeting for them or something and they definitely retaliate so I'm sure there's fear of that too yeah in fact Sean Gordon and Daryl Appleberry uh, about a year and a half ago now they were brutalized by the police and after they were released about a week later they were walking from their home on Grafton Street to downtown which is you know a, f a few miles to walk as soon as they were half a block went down to the end of their street a cop car started following them and each as they went into another district of the city another cop car of that district would then pick them up and follow them all the way to where they were and all the way back and each time they waved 
you know, and, 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 and so there is harassment. I mean, worse than that, but that's just one example. And you had a question. Yeah, I guess it's somewhat in uh, relation to that, regarding retaliation um, against people who want to be on the police accountability board. Um, if it's a four year term, I think, maybe, do you think that some people would be hesitant to want to be volunteer, even if there was an incentive for any type of um, problems? Like, even if police, like, you said police following people, like, that's mm -hmm. not going to make the news, but it's still like harassment. Yeah, we might have to put in some kind of a provision about that because as there soon is, as that happened, there is a provision. Th th there is a provision. Yeah, there's a provision. There's about a provision about that. A penalty. <laughs> there's a provision about a penalty for um, retaliation or harassment. And it's uh, I think like five thousand dollars is like the first offense, and it goes up and possible jail time. Um, and I, I would say to that, I think that if you're on the board, you're very visible, and so if that happens, you go to the media. You yeah, you're not just and you make it a point. You're not just Joe Schmo, you know. Yeah. And so that can have a real, like, one of the things that the Flying Squirrels done when these things have happened is we've gone with publicized them immediately. And that has led to some severe backpedaling on the part of the police and the city. Um, you know, like, the people got ticketed. I mean, this minor stuff, but they got parking tickets for being less than, more than a foot away, and they had these pink rulers, and we have video of this. And it just looked like a laughing stock. Like, this is what the Rochester Police Department is spending its time and money on. And we found out that that incident and a number of other incidents led to the firing of the West Side Commander because he was engaging in these sort of operations that were just, you know, frivolous. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, the, going to the media, going to the press, having that avenue, having the avenue to, like, city council, the mayor's office, the chief of police, possibly the union, you know. Those connections can lead to a certain amount of um, protection, and it can also lead to, well, and, and, the, and in the ordinance that we're proposing, there's actually a provision about retaliation. Did, nobody over here? Did, did you have one? I was just gonna ask, do you foresee any pushback from the 501c3, the, the civilian review board, the current one? Or you're not sure. Yeah, they'll, they, when we, we did a strategy of who our likely opponents are, yeah, they're not going to be happy with it, of course. They're, they're going to want to hold on to their contract because it's paying people's salaries. Um, but we've documented a pretty good case against them. Yeah. So, uh, and, and those of you who, who will actually read this, this is our 111 page actual report and ordinance. If you will read it, please feel, feel free to take one. They apparently like to connect to each other on these spiral things. But um, feel free to take one, but only take one if you're going to read it, because we have a limited copy. You had a question. Yeah. Um, something else that, um, I don't know if this is like a tangential issue, um, but I wanted to ask about it, which is that I've been reading some in the news about, um, you know, officers being um, facing stalking and harassment issues from partners and things like that. Is this a sort of overview board that's going to touch on that or only people who are encountering police in a formal way? Can you give yeah. an example? Oh yeah, there was a man in Iran, uh, a police officer in Irondequoit who was, um, I guess, barred from going to, be, like being at the station because he was harassing his ex-partner so severely. So I guess, like, are those, I mean, so that, that's a, an example of something that was handled internally, you know, at least to a certain extent. But if harassment, if, if harassment cases like that, like, you know, for example, like um, a domestic violence case that, um, that um, I, I, I don't know. Um, I think it's unlikely that a, spouse of a police officer would go through a civilian review mm -hmm. process. I think they would probably go through a different at legal means. Okay. Yeah, through a lawyer. But, but it wouldn't preclude them from going through the process if they wanted to. Right. I mean, they absolutely yeah. could. But, but yeah. yeah, that's I just tough. wouldn't address the issue in as rigorous of a way. Yeah I, yeah, I mean, and police officers, statistics I've heard, 40% uh, of police officers commit domestic violence against partners. 40%. Mm -hmm. 
I will say though that there is the, the cover up. So they'll they won't necessarily <coughs> report stuff that a police officer does. All right. To to you know to protect the police officer, even though it what should have been because it's breaking the law, and there was a report, right. they'll cover it up. That would fall under. This. Yeah, yeah, and I think you know absolutely it's unusual that we even heard about that because there is cover up all the time. Okay, yeah. let's do Sylvia yeah, first. I didn't, I didn't catch what you just said. Um, then a, a police officer attacking his own partner or his domestic partner? Either no, one. No, 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 no. Domestic. A, a domestic, like a... a, a domestic. Uh, yeah, like a, yeah, okay. like a girlfriend. Okay. No, I, I just wasn't sure. Yeah. But, okay. Go ahead. Susan? Um, in the past, I mean, there was a civilian review, you, review board um, that was created in the past, and the union kind of um, wiped it out. They've also been very active in um, making sure that there's like fa uh, the um, the um, freedom of information laws don't pertain to them and um, really have worked at a lack of transparency. Um, will this um, address some of those issues too that you know people will be able to see what's happening if there's cases that are in, you know in front of it will they be able to hear it will there be able to be um, will the union not be able to hide this stuff and will it have to be some of these laws be changed in, in, in Albany because of what the uh, fraternal order of the police or you know as I say organized crime mm -hmm. has, yeah. has done. Um, speak to your first point the police advisory board was created in 1963 after a number of really disturbing high-profile cases in 1962 and three um, and in 1960 and so that board had um, Beyond reasonable doubt is their level of evidence evidence standard. So I meant there's a really high bar to say that the police committed misconduct. At the same time, if the police chief and the board did not agree on, you know, uh, what happened or the discipline, that board could go public um, and name names and lay out the case. And then it'd be in the court of public opinion to make a decision, which is kind of a, unusual and interesting power um, because otherwise we're just advisory. In 65, the police union filed an uh, injunction against it. Uh, the federal court stopped it from functioning. Uh, eventually, it was found constitutional by the New York State Court of Appeals. The police union, you know, <coughs> brought it to the Supreme Court in 68. The Sup U.S. Supreme Court denied, uh, rejected certiorari, so it went back to the ruling of the lower court which said it was completely constitutional, which was great. In that case, the city went to bat for the people of this city, you know, which is awesome. Um, 58 came into play in 1975, uh, 76, and this is the, the law you're talking about. It's not the union per se. 50A, it's New York 50A. Civil Rights Law 50A, which states that anything that, that could be used in the, um, that nothing can be public in a, in a uh, police officer's file, employee, their employee yeah. records. Yeah. Now, if you work for the government, if you're a secretary of a senator, your, your <coughs> records, we can ask for your records. We can, we can go and see the records of, if you're a secretary of a senator. But if you're a police officer, your records are completely sealed and cannot be seen. So that's what the law 50A protects police officers against having any of that information made public. So what Susan is asking is if this particular thing, the Police Accountability Board won't address that state law, but there is a, um, a movement afoot across the state 
to try to repeal that law. And through the New York, I think New York Civil Liberties Union and several groups in New York City. Several groups in New York City were trying to get rid of that law because that law actually protected um, Daniel Pantaleo. Pantaleo, who was the one who choked Eric Garner. It protected him from from having his record of brutality be made public. So it's it's a really bad law. Um, but this particular thing won't address that, but it will raise um, awareness. And, and I, I, in my ideal of the board, I see the board standing up against that law and saying, no, it needs to be repealed. Um, just based on the powers that we're investing with the board and, and what we want it to actually end up doing. But that's I, idealism for it. Who knows what the reality is. Um, we're just winding down. I'm sorry you missed our presentation, but it's being uh, recorded. Right. And maybe for a small fee, you could uh, <laughs> watch it <laughs> at some point if you talk to Susan really nicely. Um, but just for your benefit, we have a report that we've written, and I'll give you a summary of it. And if you want a copy of it, if you read it, we'll give you a copy of it. Um, but what we're hoping is that you'll all, where's the sign-in sheet? Because there are now four people who came in after the sign-in sheet was passed around. Um, if you guys could all sign in, we'll add you to the list, which will not just be an enough is enough list, it'll be the list of the actual <coughs> Police Accountability Board group, so that when it's time to take action, you can all get involved. Which is right now. And, and Well, right. It's right now, but we're going to be calling forums. We're going to be asking people to, you know, right, right do now, stuff. Knock on doors. So, Joe had a question, then Sylvia. Yeah, so, so this was released to the media, because they saw the coverage of it in yes. the newspaper. Democrat. There's going to be another story. Okay. And so, has this actual uh, 100 and so page, um, been presented to it's gone to uh, the president of City Council Loretta Scott and the chair of the Public Safety Committee Adam McFadden yes. we have actually met with them twice and it also now has gone to all of City Council and we're going to presenting be presenting like we did today um, to City Council on April 6th and between now and then we're going to have a press conference where we get this out more um, virally in Rochester. Um, so yes, the goal is to have city council adopt this by the end of this year. And Sylvia, and then by the end of the year, you said that's the goal. Okay, you gotta have a goal. Oh, well, that's <coughs> make an election year issue months away. From yeah. Um, I think Sylvia. Yeah, I, maybe you talked about this already. Does there have to be evidence? Evidence against the police officer? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, what? Well, there's an investigation that, like, you, so you could bring a complaint. Yeah. The the board then does an investigation with an investigator, like the police would do. And, and it interviews you, interviews the police officer, interviews witnesses, well, it, and then presents yeah, evidence we, to the yeah, board. Witnesses. Yeah, but th whatever. And then presents that evidence to the yeah. board, and then the board makes a de decision. Um, so yeah, the, 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 with the regards to the evidence stuff, basically, um, the way that the CRB is structured, its level of evidence is, um, Oh, AJ, help me out. Currently? Yeah. It's currently preponderance? Preponderance, thank you, yes. Preponderance of the evidence. What we're asking for is substantial evidence, which is slightly lower. Um, under preponderance of the evidence, which is akin to like filing a civil lawsuit against somebody, um, you do need evidence. You need like, you need like a, a, a certain amount, there's evidence that rises, as I understand it, to that level of evidence, and there's other evidence that doesn't rise quite to that level. With substantial evidence, if Barbara and I are out and Bar 
well, maybe a friend of ours gets attacked, we won't name names, and by the police, and we go and corroborate what happened with the attack, under substantial evidence, our two statements could be validated as, as um, you know, actual evidence to be used in that complaint. Under preponderance of the evidence, our two statements may not raise to that level. If it's just one of us, and it's like me and the officer, and I get beat up and I complain, under the way it is now, if there's no other evidence to corroborate what happened, they side with the police officer. And so the complaint's dismissed, even if I got beat up, and you know, if there, there's something else to substantiate that there was misconduct, then, you know, sorry. <laughs> We're gonna take the word of the officer. So, so substantial evidence would um, lower that slightly and rise, you know, uh, rise the bar for evidence for, you know, those one-on-one -on -one encounters or so two-on-one -on -one encounters. I think Susan had a question and then, is your name Milo? Mm -hmm. okay. um, I have actually two things. One is, uh -oh. if, it's one at a time. Okay. Mm -hmm. If people, <laughs> questions. Um, suppose, I'm assuming you'll, you'll, there'll be hearings that people or at least Yes, there's a, a, the yes. board has hearings, right. yes. And what happens if somebody is not, a police officer is not truthful or somebody covers for another person? Is there, is, could that, are they under, um, could that lead to a legal case against Any them? of these things didn't, does not in any way preclude a civil lawsuit being filed. This is mostly going to be in cases where there is not a death um, or a really, really, really serious injury um, because in that case it would go automatically to court. So these are cases where they don't like rise to the level of going to court but are still substantially enough that they change somebody's <coughs> life, they keep them from being able to get a job, they keep them from being able to function. Um, so, yeah, did that answer your question? Could you, yeah, could you restate it maybe? I, I, I guess I'm asking is, is there anything like if they're not, if you, they are not truthful with the board? <coughs> If they commit perjury, they can be tried for perjury. Okay. That's you can make a complaint, like right now, the guy that was beat up by the police, he went to trial and his case was, he was found not guilty. He's now probably going to <coughs> either file a complaint or file a lawsuit, or he, he could file a complaint of perjury against, that the officer committed perjury. But can the board say this guy perjured himself? Yeah, yeah, so, and then yeah. also, you know, um, because let's face it, lawsuits, you have to have an attorney and, and I mean, can this say, hey, you know, and then discipline the person who lied? Right, yeah. Technically, the, the board can find not just the complaint that the complainant made, but any other thing that they see the officer did wrong, right? Yeah, like, so perjury or like falsification of documents, right? That kind of stuff, that is one of the penalties. That's one of the most egregious penalties in the, the disciplinary matrix I was talking about earlier. And in that case, um, I think it's like it's like zero strikes and you're out. You're just dismissed. There's no 30 day, 35 day suspension, right? In the case where there is a complaint and in the course of the investigation, the officer perjured themselves, the board has the authority to then send that case file to the district attorney of Monroe County or even New York State and ask that the officer be prosecuted based on search, such and such evidence. So in the case of perjury, I'm assuming that's a criminal offense in which case, and I'm assuming that because I'm not a lawyer, there's a lawyer in the room, it, it, I'm sorry, I need to keep pointing at you. Is, that a, is perjury, that's criminal, correct? Yes. Yeah, so thank you for... <laughs> that legal opinion. Yes, yeah. Yeah. yes. Very strong. Solid, solid. That's a good, yeah. <laughs> not legal advice. No, no you're not. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in that case, the board could pass the name of the officer on to the DA or uh, the Attorney General's Office of New York State and say, we would like you to open a case against this officer for criminal perjury. Yeah. Okay, your second part and then Milo. Okay. <laughs> that was the second question. What can um, we do or what can people do? I know you said read the report and you know talk about it, but is there anything more substantial? Is there something that 
people can do to kind of push the um, ideas and the uh, subject along so that uh, should we call the mayor and I wouldn't call the mayor I went there will be a time and if you're on our email list watch for that because there will be alerts do this call your it'll be mostly call your city council okay. person because this is under city council not the mayor okay um, you know though I'm sure there this will become an election issue um, between you know the three who are running for mayor um, obviously Jim Shepard I mean I'm not telling you to vote for but Jim Shepard was a police chief and under whom a lot of this stuff happened um, but that's all I'm gonna say about that and you know you don't get three no 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 I wanted I, I guess I'm not I, I'm filming <laughs> this okay so is there a place that people can go to get information or to sign up yeah you can go to oh. enough is enough dot org -O -C -U -S dot org and you oh. can find out more there say it more again it's slowly. enough is enough e n o e n o u g h i s e n o u g h dot r o c u s dot o r g um and yeah get on the mailing list um Talk about it on Facebook, talk about it on social media, tweet about it, um, call your local, yeah, call your representative. Um, call, call us. Call, call please, we're, we're so lonely. 585 354 9504. That's 585 354 9504. Call now for 1999. Yes, my. Um, I guess one thing that I noticed maybe just looking around this room i don't know um is that we're sort of a pale crowd yes because both of you are white as well yes um so i guess i wanted to ask how have you worked with communities that are most affected by this violence and what part have they had in putting together this report yes that's a good question that's a very good question and we have had contact with everyone who is there are like 10 cases highlighted mm -hmm. in this document uh, we've had contact with most of those people we're going out to churches we're going out to community groups we're um, working with United Christian Leadership Ministry which is a group of black churches um, we we're sorry that we're white it, it, we can't do anything about it uh, but we have worked with affected communities, affected communities and affected people and we're building a coalition around that but it's a very good point and if you know, if anybody here knows any groups that would like us to come present or want copies of the report, like let us know. I mean, you know, we're we're definitely interested in like spreading this more, getting it the word out. I mean, right now we're in this phase of like raising the awareness about it, even existing. Um, so we're going to all different groups. This just happens to be very white tonight. Yes. So I have two quick ones. Is there a place where we can get a digital copy of the report? Yes. Pass around? On the Enough on is Enough website. website. Yep. And for your April 6th presentation to City Council, I was wondering if that's public. No? Okay. No, it's not. It's in room 208A, and that's only going to fit about mm. 20 people, so. Yeah. I was hoping that we could like uh, but, but we will there, push for, for yeah, here. Public forum. Yeah, public definitely. forums. Absolutely. City Council. Yeah. If you want to write your city councilor and tell them that you agree with this, you think it's good, please. Yeah, when well, we're looking for letters of support. So number one thing you can do is if you are part of any group that we could do this type of presentation with or that would like a digital copy of the report, send it to them. We have a letter, a sample letter of support that we can send to you that you can adapt as long as it's supportive you can adapt it <laughs> and then we're going to take that whole file of all the letters of support to city council so that's the first thing you can do is if you're part of any group whatsoever that would be interested in having us make a presentation or reading the digital copy reading the short version both the short version and the long version are on the website yes have you reached out to rcsd for support not yet i have no idea how you would start that. I'm a teacher. Okay. <laughs> so can you put us in touch with That's the right the people? I don't that is just like a big blob to me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um great. That would be great if you could do that. Yeah, that would be great. 
So we will send you all, we'll, we'll put you all on the mailing list, and then if you have ideas, just shoot them to us. And we'll, we'll resend the, both of the digital copies of the report out over that list as well. Anyone else besides Susan? Mm -hmm. Susan. I'm sorry. No, it's no, good. What is the, what, I'm, I'm just curious. We have 2% of the, um, the, you know, people who <coughs> bring a case to the Civilian Review Board being reviewed or having being sustained, sustained. having this, the complaint sustained. What is it in like Syracuse now that they've implemented this? Kind in of Syracuse over the last three years, it's an average of 23%. Was, I think 2015 was 31, is that? Yeah, yeah. but it went down to 17% last year. Last year. Okay. And, so and before this, how, what was it? They didn't, there's no, records there's no records that we could get. Uh, you so know. there's been, you know, it seems like there's been a substantial. Yeah, and and the other problem with this is that some of the other organizations or cities where this is happening are so new that we don't have data yet. Like Oakland just put theirs into effect in November. The city of Newark just put theirs into effect in the spring. So we don't have a lot of data <coughs> of similar, you know, and, and one thing we're hoping for is uh, Mayor Warren loves to ha to be have Rochester be on the cutting cutting edge, be innovative. We're innovative, so we want to be innovative and you know make this be something she can run. So, uh, if you're a Warren fan, that's all I'm saying. Jeez, who are you endorsing? I'm just that? saying. <laughs> I'm not a fan. I'm just saying. I lost what I was going to say. Anybody have a question while well, Ted's trying to find what he was going to say? Susan? <laughs> Wait, what were you? Oh, yes, oh. sir, please. <laughs> sir. <laughs> oh, sorry. Butch, by the way. Oh, um, okay, Butch. You might have covered this. I'm not, I mean, actually have two questions. One is, is there. Uh, Just one at a time. I, I, I was going to give them both without one answer. All right. Um, you may have covered this. I'm not certain. Is there anything in here that's going to incorporate mandatory counseling for officers, not just the ones identified for having a complaint raised against, but the entire police force? There's training included in in the disciplinary. For the entire police force. Well, the entire police force. Another thing that we component. another thing that we need to broaden in our document or post document is how this board can affect the policies and procedures of the whole department. Because yeah, we can go after these individual officers, and this has been told to us by a, a police uh, accountability expert who's at the University of Nebraska who wrote us a letter saying, you need to broaden this to include, you can review all the policies and procedures of the Rochester Police Department and advise them to make changes. So that would go under that, that everybody, every officer has to have anti-racism training. Every officer has to have restorative justice training, you know, de-escalation techniques, <coughs> all that kind of stuff. And, and, and that was, that was, um, yeah, that, that he was, he was calling for like an office of, uh, or not office, but like a, a police monitor type of role in, in the ordinance. Um, also in 92, when, when this ordinance was passed, city council passed an ordinance, like a, a joint ordinance with it, that basically said like, the department had to make some changes. And so in the report, we called for city council to update that report, and, or update that resolution, <coughs> and to pass it as well. That, that city council will actually pass an ordinance saying police have to have this, this you right. know, they, all these. They will get, the training, this training that's mandated. I, I know I'm getting older, but I just want to make sure I heard you correctly. You said 1992? Yes. Yeah, 1992 was the ordinance, when the ordinance for the current civilian review process went into effect. Locally? Yeah. Yeah. And we, we, were, we, we would have loved to have gone back to 92 to write the report with all that data, but... They didn't have data. They got rid of it after... So we could only years. go back 15 years. Yeah. We couldn't go back. 25 years. It's gone, apparently, mysteriously. But if we had gone back 25 years, we'd still be writing the report, so I'm just as glad we didn't. And it would still be 2%. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
The other question I have, which might fall into the same purview of what I just asked, is there's a uh, history of cops being um, addressed, police officers, all right, being addressed by their uh, local uh, police department and being shelved out and having their records closed, and then that police officer goes to another right. community. Is there something in there to make that transparent so police agencies can see that that would go under 50A if we can get you know right now we can't get any of those records because there's a law prohibiting it. That's the one that's underfoot. You said in New York State. That's right. yeah. That there's a it protects the officer and that's right. encompassed with inside of that. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sort of. So any any information that could be used to evaluate the promotion or hiring or firing of an officer can be withheld from public view. At discretion of the officer. If the officer says release it, then it can be released, yes. yes. Which they're never gonna do. Yes. I was just wondering if there's fear within like some council <coughs> people that you've talked to and that about this increasing the lawsuits and the fact that this is going to end up costing the city a lot more money because if people are held accountable then they actually would be um there would be proof that something was wrong it actually i think should decrease the lawsuits because right now millions of dollars are paid out because the police aren't held accountable they stay in their jobs they commit these misconduct it goes to a civil lawsuit that then they have to p pay out millions of dollars. I think it should actually save the city money because the bad, well, the, 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 uh, the cops who are committing these offenses <coughs> most prevalently will be gotten rid of and so there won't be lawsuits. That's, that would be my hope. Right, and if you have an officer that is getting sustained complaints against them, that disciplinary matrix means that there's a much quicker way for them to exit the force than to continue in this pattern and practice of abuse. You know, so that way that there's a mechanism to jettison folks that are popping up again and again. Right, right. and because the other thing that happens right now is that is the, the police know who the, who are the officers who are doing this, and they're saying, well, because of 50A, we can't give you that information. But what could happen is you could assign each police officer a number mm -hmm. and, the, and the accountability board could start tracking which officers, which numbers, you know, officer one, officer two, officer three. Well, gee, officer three certainly seems to have a lot of complaints. Well, let's look into that <coughs> without knowing the person's name. So you can, there's a ways to get around that. They just haven't chosen to use them. The other thing is um, data is not standardized across the country. So in some cities, um, like Albuquerque, New Mexico, they actually list the age, the gender, and the race of the complainant. In Rochester, New York, nope. They don't list anything. So it's really hard to find out. It's, it's hard to say that racial profiling exists when there aren't records of race right. on, you know, thing. So. How convenient. <laughs> Well, thank you all very much for coming and for being so attentive and uh, inquisitive. Thank you. We appreciate it. And um, hey. please do tell tell the groups that you're part of. Um, just like to thank Barbara and Ted for presenting tonight. Yeah. And I'm sure they'll be around to ask more questions. Um, if I apologize for all the questions, but um, all the questions. inquisitive minds want to know. Um, and thank you for this coming to this community space. Um, you're always welcome. If you look uh, at the squirrel.org, there's lots of activities, speakers, film showings. So come on out and uh, join a community that's hoping to make positive change in the community. So thank you again. Thank, thank you. you.